Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Ray Mabus. Admiral Phil Wisecup, you know, we have great leadership in the Navy and Marine Corps. All the way from brand new third class petty officers all the way up through the most senior flags. And we've got some of that great leadership sitting down here in front today. Um, and I just want to take one minute to thank Phil Wisecup, a great head of the Naval War College. And <laughs> Admiral Wise Cup was nice enough to invite me last year when I had been in office about a week. <laughs> he was even nicer not to uh, ask many pointed questions uh, since he knew how new I was. But I thought that I should come back today with hopefully a little more experience under my belt. And as he said, I just got back from a trip, Italy, Afghanistan, Suda Bay Crete, and Morocco to see African Lion, the marine exercise, the biggest exercise in, on the African continent that we run. And as I was coming back, it did dawn on me, thinking about this conference, that I'd been in office almost exactly a year. So some of us took just for a moment and decided to see where, where I'd been, what I'd done over the past year. In that year, I've had the amazing opportunity to visit with sailors and Marines all over the world. It's a great representation where I've been of what our Navy and Marine Corps are today and where they are today. I've flown over 115,000 miles, almost 10,000 miles a month, a third of the distance to the moon. I've visited 22 countries, 21 states. From those in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan to our ships on station in the Arabian Gulf and off the coast of Haiti. And in almost a hundred all hands calls, I've talked to literally thousands and thousands of sailors and Marines. And every time I've done it, every single time, I have been just constantly impressed by the courage, by the determination, by the dedication, by the skill of every sailor and Marine that have been there. Ever since the end of the Second World War, the consistent forward presence of American ships and the consistent forward presence of our naval combat power has been the most visible demonstration of our commitment to the international community and the ultimate guarantor of safety, security for global co commerce, particularly maritime commerce. Forward presence, international engagement and security cooperation also directly support American national security objectives and the work of other parts of our government, like the State Department, and USAID, because increasingly, as you are talking about at the War College and at this seminar, the Navy and Marine Corps are involved in more than warfare. They're involved in diplomacy, in information, in humanitarian aid and economics, as well as military force. And these sailors and Marines that I have been meeting around the world are the instruments of that. They are the face of America. 
The Navy Marine Corps role can be as simple as a strike group pulling into port where the captains and the commanders meet with the local leaders and where our sailors and Marines interact with local population. They're the face of America. It's often the only time people will see an American or get to talk to one. It's our sailors and our Marines that they see. And whether it's a routine port call or an emergency relief effort, the face of America is the face of sailors and Marines. In just the past few years, you look at what we've done. Navy Marine Corps have responded to earthquakes and tsunamis and flooding. We've been in Pakistan and Indonesia, the Philippines, Oceania, Samoa, and Haiti. Just last week, the Underwood supported the relief mission in Guatemala after Tropical Storm Agatha and it distributed more than 100,000 pounds of supplies in the two weeks she was there. In the Middle East, we built several combined task forces in over 20 countries, including Iraq and first ever commands for Bahrain and the UAE have successfully led these task forces through months of difficult operations, combating pirates, protecting global commerce. Partnership as this seminar points out, is becoming the rule. Some of our partners share our platforms. Japanese, Dutch, Canadian pilots are flying P-3s, both for ISR out of Djibouti and counter-narcotics in the Caribbean. Japanese DDGs, equipped with Aegis, have sailed the Indian Ocean as part of Operation Enduring Freedom, and Korea has integrated their Aegis ships in the radar network monitoring, in the radar network, which is monitoring the unpredictable regime to their north. Spain has deployed the Alvara de Bazan with the Theodore Roosevelt Strike Group, and Norway's Roan Amundsen participated in the summer workups of the Harry Truman Strike Group. 2009. We're forging new ties. We're doing it through mentoring, through training exercises from the west coast of Africa to the western Pacific. We're enhancing cooperation. We're building maritime security capacity. In all these partnerships, we share technology and we share tactical and operational procedures and interoperability. More importantly, we share personal relationships between the commanders, between the crews, the ships and aircraft, and it brings us all closer together. As others have said before me, you can surge people, you can surge equipment, you cannot surge trust. But our excellence in all areas of combat and operational capacity, in our presence and in our partnerships, comes at a cost. We spend a lot of money to buy our ships and our aircraft, our tactical vehicles, our weapon systems, to fuel them, to get them where they're needed, and train and equip the people to operate them. And those costs keep going up. And what that requires is that we take some steps now to assure affordability so that we can keep meeting the missions that we've been assigned. The missions required to keep our nation and global commerce secure. I know I'm not the first secretary to talk about affordability. And I think it's a fair question to ask, well, what's different now? The answer is simple. The economic environment that confronts not just America, but every country across the globe is what's different. Now, despite these economic tough times, nobody can doubt the commitment of this administration to national security. The Department of Defense was one of only three agencies, Veterans Affairs and Homeland Security were the other two, 
to receive additional money in this year's budget. Both the President and the Secretary of Defense made it clear that we've got to do a better job of managing those tax dollars. There are no sacred cows, and everything is on the table as we review every dollar we spend and how we spend it. First job I ever had in elective office was a state auditor of Mississippi. I know how to read a budget, and I'm no stranger to demanding accountability. Every dollar wasted is a dollar we can't spend <coughs> protecting our sailors and our Marines. Every dollar wasted is a dollar we cannot spend building the fleet that we need. And every dollar wasted is a dollar we can't spend defending this country. Last month, <coughs> I outlined the governing principles for Navy and Marine Corps acquisitions and how our department will operate to make every single dollar count. So much of the acquisition process comes down to weighing cost against capability. And we haven't always done that very effectively. <coughs> and I need some water. Thanks for the help. <laughs> I'll give you an example. The VH-71 presidential helicopter would have been an incredibly capable machine. But as Secretary Gates said, do we really need a helicopter in which you can cook a gourmet meal while fleeing a nuclear blast? <laughs> Probably not. The requirements exceeded the need and it exceeded our resources. Sometimes, sometimes requirements change. DDG-1000, another incredibly capable platform, but one that had a very specific mission. And the world changed, and technology changed since the ship was designed. And it was decided that we needed more flexibility in the fleet. So that class was truncated at three ships, this technology was captured, and the Burke line was restarted to do more of the missions we need to do for far less cost overall. In the Navy, we've started a formal gate review to identify the correct requirements for every major program. And it brings together operators from the fleet and programmers and technical experts and our acquisition team to look at cost versus capability to make informed decisions about whether to move forward or not move forward on a specific contract. And once we make decisions on what to buy, we need to stick with those decisions. In the short term, we just can't be taken by every new technology the second that it's invented. And we can't force it on every platform or weapon system that's in the process of being built. Over the longer term, we owe industry stable designs and stable intentions for what we'll buy and build so that they can make some long-range decisions themselves. And I think we're doing that. We've made a commitment to build an average of 10 ships a year over the next five years. But with that sort of stability, I expect industry to make the necessary investments in infrastructure and in training to build those 50 ships. I also expect that both cost and construction time will come down with each successive platform built. Some of the classes of ships and aircraft that we have built have been incredibly successful at this. The Virginia class attack submarine, the P-8, the Lewis and Clark T-A-K-E. Some have not, but on time and on budget, have to be the standard. We all, Navy, Marine Corps, and industry, have to meet our targets. Where it does not, 
or where we do not, I won't hesitate to cancel or restructure programs, contracts, just as we did when we down-selected on the LCS. The way we write contracts is equally important. In the past, we've had to pay for some defective work just because our contracts weren't written well enough. In some cases, we paid for the same welding job two or three times because the contractor didn't do the job correctly and we didn't write the contract correctly. And that's wrong. It's wrong because it hurts taxpayers and it's wrong because, because it hurts our national defense. So we need to do the mind-numbing thing of going through these contracts thoroughly. And I gotta tell you, it's one of the reasons I quit being a lawyer was doing stuff like this, but we have to do it. <laughs> and to do it, we need to recruit and train the right people. And we need to pay for results and not process. One change we're making in our contracts is to rely more on fixed price contracts for all but the very highest risk systems and first of a class ships or aircraft because cost plus contracts are too often just that. Cost plus, cost too much. In the end, it's about using our resources a lot more wisely. Because the long-term ability of the Navy and Marine Corps to support America's broader foreign policy objectives, to remain the strategic leader in the world, to answer the very question this forum poses, depends on our ability to adequately resource our fleet. Now the question of resources extends to how we power that fleet and those aircraft and those vehicles. Today, Competition for natural resources, specifically oil, is one of the chief drivers of the global economy and is a national security issue for the United States. Strategically, we know we buy too much oil from potentially volatile areas of the world. We would never let some of the places we depend on for oil build our ships, our aircraft, our weapon systems, our vehicles. But those places have a real say in when and how we sail or fly or drive those platforms. So we in the Navy and the Marine Corps need to be more energy efficient and we need to use more homegrown alternatives to fossil fuels to improve our energy security, to increase energy independence, and to grow a new energy economy. It'll make us a better military force strategically and it will improve our combat ability tactically. Many of you know this from our operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Just think about what it takes to get a gallon of gas to a frontline unit in Afghanistan. I visited a bunch of fobs last week, Musa Kayla and Delaram. And to get a gallon of gas to one of those units, you gotta take it across the Pacific, you gotta put it on trucks, you gotta take it across the Hindu Kush, and all the way down to one of those forward operating bases. And only then do you get to put it in, a, in the tank of a vehicle or a generator. Every step of the process, you add money. And every step of the process, you take Marines away from combat and engagement and development to guard that gasoline. And for every 25 trucks we send into Afghanistan, we lose a Marine, killed or wounded. If we can make our systems more efficient, or if we can replace that fuel power generator with solar or geothermal, we can save lives, we can save money, and we can increase our combat capability by letting Marines do what Marines need to do, fight, engage, rebuild. And it's for those reasons 
that we established five energy goals for the Department of the Navy last year, most important of which requires the Navy and Marine Corps to get half our energy from alternative sources within 10 years, by 2020. We're moving aggressively in that way. We've flown a Hornet on biofuels at Pax River, the Green Hornet. <laughs> I know how old you are if you laughed at that. <laughs> My children have no idea who the Green Hornet is. <laughs> We've launched a hybrid powered ship that saved $2 million on its first voyage from Pascagoula, Mississippi around South America to its home port in San, Di San Diego. We're testing expeditionary energy concepts at Quantico. We're expanding solar capacity throughout the West and implementing energy efficiency measures across the fleet. It won't be easy, but we will be a better fighting force because of this. The Navy and the Marine Corps have always led this country in technological advances. We moved from wind to coal in the middle of the 19th century. We moved from coal to oil early in the 20th century, and in the middle of the 20th century, we added nuclear power to our fleet. Every single time we changed technologies, every time, there were skeptics that said, you're trading one very proven method of powering the fleet for something that is unproven, expensive, and may not work. But the Navy and Marine Corps have always done it, and they've never, ever backed down from a challenge. We have led in technological change. And we've created the greatest expeditionary force the world has ever known because of our willingness to embrace that sort of change and because of the quality of the people we have manning the fleet as sailors and Marines. Quality of people, like the people at the War College, like the people sitting here today. That's our edge. The willingness to try something new. The willingness to make ourselves better. The willingness to be an innovator and a leader. The willingness to lead. And so to the students here today, to the students here at the War College, I first want to thank you for your service. Thank you for being leaders in the fleet and in the other armed forces of our country. This year that you will spend in Newport is incredibly important to your professional development. It affords you some time to study and to think about how to make our military better. But it's also important to our country and to our world because your leadership will make us more secure. As you go to your next assignment, remember what the uniform you wear really means and why we all serve. We serve the greatest country on earth and what it stands for and in accepting that privilege of leadership. We accept the responsibility to serve the sailors and marines, the soldiers and the airmen that we work with to serve those on the front lines who bear the heaviest burden and take the greatest risk. The legacy of the Navy and Marine Corps is a legacy of leadership. And now it is up to you students here at the War College to maintain that legacy. You follow in some pretty amazing footsteps. It's your turn to lead us into the future, to write the next chapter for our military service and for our country. Write them well. Thank you very much.
I'll be happy to do some questions. There's a hand already up. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, that was a very good talk, and you've been humble enough to talk about the great people in the Navy and not talk about yourself. I'm wondering how you wish to put your own stamp on the Navy during the time that you will serve. How do you see fashioning your own role? And if somebody walked in your office in the middle of a work day, what would you hope to be doing? What are you doing? What are the meetings that give you the most gratification? If you could give us a sense of how you want to mold your job and what you do and the legacy you'd like to leave. All right, thank you. Um, if somebody walked into my office at midday, I would hope not to be listening to yet another PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <clears throat> but that hope would almost certainly be in vain. I think, I, I, I'll say five things. One is that during this time that our sailors and Marines were taken care of, that they had the tools they needed, they had the training that they deserved, and they had what they needed to, to do the mission. Secondly, that part of my job is to talk to the rest of the country, to the 99% who do not wear the uniform in this country about why we need a Navy and a Marine Corps, about why it is so valuable to us, about why we need to remain a global power and a global fleet and project power and reassurance globally. And then three specific things. One is energy. If we can move from dependence on fossil fuels, on foreign sources of energy, to more sustainable resources, to make us better strategically, better tactically, and oh, by the way, help our country, help the environment, um, then I think that's a major thing. And I think we can lead the country in doing that. Uh, to, to steal a line and flip it from field of dreams, if the Navy comes, they will build it. We've, we can create a market for this, and that's what we're trying to do. Secondly is acquisition excellence. If we can build the ships, the aircraft, the weapon systems that we need, we can do it on budget, we can do it on time, then a lot of what I do will have been a success because we'll have the fleet that we need going forward. We'll have the aircraft that we need going forward. We'll have the weapon systems that we need going forward. And third, if we can be a leader in unmanned systems because that's the future, and we cannot afford to fall behind in that. If you, the good news about unmanned systems is they're relatively cheap and easy to deploy. The bad news about unmanned systems is they're relatively cheap and easy to deploy. <laughs> We're not the only ones doing this, and we cannot afford to fall behind on that. So if I can do those two things involving our sailors and Marines and the three things just on very specific items, then I think my time will be well spent here. Um, and uh, it is the greatest privilege of my life to have this job. It, um, I cannot imagine being in a better place doing better things than I'm doing right now. Can't see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, given the uh, blowout preventer failure in the Gulf and the economic constraints of the economy, could you comment or is there an existing system of technology transfer, from DOD technology transfer, that may be encapsulated in black boxes through some declassification filter to commercial applications? Are you talking specifically now about... Um, I'm talking about materials, systems, data. About, about the weld? 
No, not specifically the well, the general concept of transference of technology to get a double bang for the buck, a la what NASA did for years. Is there, there a system in place within DOD, or could there be? There is, there is, there is and continues to be a transfer of technology from the military to the civilian side. Um, all you got to do is look at GPS, flat screen TVs, things like that. It's ongoing. It, it's, I'm not sure a system is the right word, but it goes in. Um, it's, it's part of what I was talking about. If the Navy comes, they will build it. If the military has a need and is willing to invest the time and energy and resources in developing something, many times it, it's the leader in, um, in, in, a, in early ad adopting of those new technologies and then in moving it to the civilian side. Um, if I may, I think the what happened in or what's happening in the well in the Gulf is another reason why we need to start looking for alternative sources of fuel um, that we can stuff like algae, second and third generation biofuel, solar, geothermal, hydrothermal stuff that uh, that we can do in this country and stuff that do not have the catastrophic side effects if something goes wrong. Question here. Where? Here. Right here? Oh, okay. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, in view of the ongoing review of naval weapons systems with an eye to a smaller budget and at the same time the great success of systems such as the Virgi Virginia class submarines, um, and this is continuing really on the same theme that we've been on just now, um, where do you see the greatest leapfrogs forward over the next decade based on meetings that you uh, participate in and all the information, the tremendous information flow that you, that you view, the things like DARPA, or DARPA is working on? Uh, I realize the constraints of uh, classi classified material, but, uh, you know, where, what's going on where you're taken aback and you say to yourself, oh my God, can we really do that in this decade? I'm pretty sure I can't talk about a lot of those oh my God. Um, <laughs> except to note that that note in your inside pocket, um, no. Um, <laughs> I think I've talked about them. I think you're going to see the biggest leapfrogs in things like the way we use and produce energy. Um, we're, we're in first generation biofuels right now, corn based ethanol, which is not very efficient at all. It takes almost a gallon of gasoline to make a gallon of ethanol, which sort of, you can't make that up in volume. <laughs> it, but, we're, we're moving to second and third generation things, algae-based, cellulosic-based um, ethanol. Uh, the, the Green Hornet flew on camelina, which is a mustard seed type thing, and uh, it's not edible. And it's also, um, it, it, you can put it in rotation with other crops. It actually helps the soil. We signed a, a memorandum of understanding with this, Department of Agriculture, so we can help American farmers um, in terms of our research, their research, and putting together some of the things that uh, that we're doing. We're also got a bunch of groups working with the Department of Energy. I've had uh, a whole lot of meetings with Stephen Chu, the Secretary of Energy, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, the next meeting, I fully hope to understand most of what he says. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so smart it is frightening and for an English major from Ole Miss <laughs> translating that sort of stuff um, but the fact that we've got somebody like Stephen Chu who's willing to be in government and willing to work on some of these things is, is pretty astounding 
Um, I think you're going to see some leapfrogs there. It, and, and it's not just going to be in terms of biofuels, uh, solar, the way we capture energy from the sun, wind, uh, geothermal, hydrothermal, uh, just myriad things, energy from, from trash, energy from garbage that uh, otherwise goes to landfills. So I think you're going to see some, some big jumps there. That will translate to this other question into the, into the private sector, I think, pretty fast. I also think you're going to see some big jumps in unmanned systems. Um, we're, the, we're the only service that needs unmanned systems above the sea, on the sea, and under the sea. And they can be far more persistent. They can be far less intrusive. They can, they can do some things that um, undetected that you can't do if you've got a person on board. So I think that you're going to see a lot, of, a, a, a lot of progress in that area. My favorite ad for the Navy that I've seen so far is one in a gaming magazine. You, uh, we, we advertise in those magazines to get programmers. And it was for an underwater unmanned system, a UUV. <laughs> and it showed a mine hunting UUV. And the tagline was, because those bomb sniffing dogs just don't work that well underwater. <laughs> And they're right. <laughs> so, so I, I think, I think I've, I've talked about a lot of the places you're going to see some, some leapfrogs, and, and those, those type of things are not classified. Um, but I do think that they translate very fast into, um, into the private sector. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Shar Resnack. I'm the science advisor um, at Fleet Forces Command. So I like all that cool technology stuff that you said. <laughs> anyway, um, basically, my question to you, and what we've heard here is a lot of the relationships and the boots on the ground and the talking. One of the things that you read in the National Security Strategy and the, the NOC is about NECC, Navy Expeditionary Combat Command, and how important they really are. Well, they're small, and they're, they're, they're a lot of bang for the buck for the money that you give them. You know, they don't need the aircraft carrier, they don't need all these big, you know, the JSF, things that are really expensive. But they're really hard for me to advocate whenever I go to get support. I work with my OFNAV counterparts, my program office counterparts, and my problem is if I go to NAVC, NAV Air, Spay War, they're really thinking about all the big stuff. And, oh yeah, yeah, and we'll get to NECC. Same thing with OFNAV, 86, 87, 88, big bucks. 85, little guy on the corner. How can we help NECC? I think that really the return on investment, I mean, if you look at Bank for Buck, they really are the best thing going, but I find it hard as the Fleet Forces Science Advisor to really advocate enough for them. Well, I agree with you about NECC and the bang for the buck that we get, and in FY10 and in FY11, we've pretty dramatically increase the amount of money going to NECC. And um, all the N8 folks um, pretty much have supported that. Um, I think that as we, the only, the only small part that I would disagree with a little bit is that NECC, like almost everything else in the Navy, the platforms, the bigger platforms that we've got are very flexible. They can get NECC places that NECC can't get on their own. They can, they can do some things. I mean, you know, we rescued Captain Phillips, Mersk, Alabama, off the back of an Aegis destroyer. Now, that wasn't what that Aegis was built with in mind, but it made a fine platform to do it. And I think that one of the things we've got to look at is how flexible our platforms are. And we got to buy platforms that do lots of different things. And supporting people like NECC is one of those things. And with NECC's mission, um, particularly as we move into 
more hybrid warfare, more irregular warfare. Um, I don't think its importance can be overstated. And I, and I know that I speak for the CNO in terms of resourcing an ECC to the levels that they that their mission needs. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, Mr. Secretary. We have another one? There we go. There you go. I'm uh, Michael Fay from Boston, and I'm one of your law school classmates. Um, <laughs> How come you look so much younger than I do? <laughs> I can still fool some of the people some of the time. <laughs> and I'm glad to see you're a recovering lawyer. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. In the last year, um, the most, in civilian circles, the most widely scrutinized military pro policy proposal, uh, the one that's most politicized, is the president's proposal to repeal the policy known as don't ask, don't tell. Uh, and I'm going to ask you for your comment on that and its consequences for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, you're way too late to put me on the spot on that one. <laughs> I have uh, said publicly that I think don't ask, don't tell needs to be repealed. And, but I've also said that I think that the um, survey that we're going through now, the process that we're going through now that will be finished um, in early December is an important part of that, that we need to listen to the force, to the Navy, Marine Corps, about what are going to be, what if any, are going to be the obstacles to, to doing this. Uh, and that their voices are important and their voices count in this in terms of how we implement uh, any change that Congress decides to make because it's up to Congress in the end. Um, and I'll say a couple of other things. It's, this is not a debate about whether gays serve in the military. Gays serve in the military right now. And I'll quote the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. It's whether we and they can be honest about the whole thing. Secondly, I think it's important to remember that we're talking about orientation and not activity. I remove people from the service on a pretty regular basis for violating rules about heterosexual activity. And I think that, that it's important to, to understand that we have the rules in place today to maintain good order and discipline. But last, and I think most important, I have an almost infinite amount of faith in the sailors and Marines that we have out there. They can do anything, and they will implement any mission they are given, including this one. And they'll do it professionally, and they'll do it with a minimum of disruption. And I think that, um, that, when, that we ought to, that that ought to be one of the things that enters into this decision is how good this force is. And finally, I don't think that we ought to keep anybody from serving their country because of sexual orientation. You know, how about... Uh, <laughs> the hook's coming. We'll do uh, two more. And, and I think people have had their hand up here. Edward Polk, uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, with some of our airframes being very worn out uh, for many years of no fly zone patrol and all of that, you see the Joint Strike Fighter um, coming online in you know, all the variants that are possible in the near future? Uh, <clears throat> I think that we've got a, a good sense now. JSF, the Marines version. We've already got aircraft at Pax River undergoing tests. The Marine IOC has stayed constant in late uh, calendar year 12. Um, because of a restructure of the JSF program, the Navy's IOC has slid by 13 months. Um, it went from, um, well, it slid for 13 months, but our initial deployment uh, has not slid yet. 
and you're absolutely right, we're, we're using aircraft in ways that we have not anticipated. Uh, and the best example is uh, flying off carriers to go overhead in Afghanistan. That's about a seven hour flight. Uh, planes off carriers normally don't, don't fly for seven hours and get refueled as many times as they do. So we're, we're building up flight hours very, very quickly on, on the, particularly the strike aircraft that, that we have today. Um, but it goes all across the fleet. We're, we're pulling, you know, um, my, my aide here today, uh, Lieutenant Commander Sean Bartlett is a P-3 pilot. He's flown on the same airframes that his father flew on in the P-3. Um, we need the P-8s and in, in, in all across the board. And there was the last one, the gentleman was standing up. Yeah. several years ago who built five tanks and three were propelled by diesel and two by steam. Steam powered ship consumed a hundred tons of fuel a day. Diesel powered ships consumed 35 tons a day. So my question is uh, how many of your auxiliaries are steam powered with oil fired boilers? And then the other question that I have is the quality of fuel. When I was in the Merchant Marine, I was an engineer. And we used to haul Navy cargoes. The quality of the fuel was like putting high test gas in a, an old farm wagon. So we could run a boiler for two days without cleaning the burners. That's very expensive fuel. Maybe there's something to be done there. Uh, we power the vessels that are still oil fired. The um, thing I was talking about with the hybrid drive, uh, you've got um, um, two, two propulsion systems, one gas turbine for speeds over 10 knots and the other electric drive for speeds under 10 knots, and that's the ship, the Macon Island, big deck amphib, that um, on its first voyage saved almost $2 million using that sort of thing. So that's what we're moving toward. Um, Admiral Wisecup said I was on the Little Rock, which was 600 pound steam uh, thing. You know, one of the first things you learn, don't check for a steam leak with your fingers. <laughs> But we've, um, we've, we've moved from steam to diesel to now to, to hybrid to, um, um, to, to, to newer forms of drives. And in terms of the fuel, um, I just want to make one more pitch for my um, alternative fuels. When we flew the F-18 at more than the speed of sound, Mach 1.2, uh, on a mixture of Avgas and Camelina 50-50. That airplane didn't know the difference. Um, the, um, it burned Camelina just like it burned Avgas. And um, that's where we've got to be for the future. I, I know I've got more questions, but uh, y'all have a, a uh, a seminar to uh, to keep on schedule, and I do want to thank you one more time for for your hospitality here, for your support, uh, but most of all for the thinking that you do for our Navy and Marine Corps. Thank you.